online teaching does not equal online learning. I was going to give this lecture a couple weeks from now to a graduate class here at Ohio State, and I decided to go ahead and do it a little sooner, put it online because of the coronavirus. Hopefully, we'll all be back in the classroom soon, but until then, I want to talk about how we really engage our students when we're doing online instruction. Let's just jump in. First, I've got two questions. Have you ever had that deadly boring professor? Like, monotone, torturous lecture. Maybe it was when you were an undergrad student, thinking back. Maybe it was a couple of weeks ago at an academic conference. <laughs> Either way, my second question is a little more personal. Is that professor you? <laughs> Ouch, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to be personal. I'm asking the same question to myself. Is that professor me? So I'm Brian Reyes and I teach at Ohio State. I've been there for almost a quarter of a century uh, in the Department of Extension doing our outreach across the state. I also teach in the Ag Communica Agricultural Communications Education Leadership Department and a second year uh, transformational experience program with undergrads from Cross University, pretty cool stuff. I am always trying to figure out how to improve my lectures, how to improve my teaching. So this is a serious question for myself. Uh, if we were uh, in person, I would ask, uh, uh, I always like to get feedback from my, from my students. I always learn from my students. So I would ask, how many of you have taken an online class? How many of you have taught online so I can understand my audience a little bit more? The main thing I don't want to happen is like a psych episode. Cause of death, online instruction. <laughs> Quick background. About five years ago, six years ago, uh, the faculty council at Ohio State, I was on that and uh, at, for our college, and we had an agenda item. How can we use technology to improve our online teaching? And simultaneously, I happened to be teaching a, uh, a distance class, my first one, Leadership and Administration, 8420. I had this moment of insanity, to be honest, fear. I was teaching a class, I was leading a course on leadership with 25 masters and PhD students, and I thought, I better get this right, or at least I better do everything I can to understand how to engage them in a meaningful way so that they get what they are supposed to be getting out of this class. So faculty council's premise, distance learning options are growing, flipped classrooms, additional learning opportunities, we have tools available more so than ever. My premise, that most online lectures, especially if they were asynchronous, are like slow, Poison. <laughs> Talking head behind a desk, even if you've got a nice, you know, Ohio State background or whatever, wherever you are, um, we just, ah, that monotone, we, we can't do that. Worse yet, posting a PowerPoint for an online class with no explanation or maybe just a monotone voiceover. I've talked to a lot of students, they hate it. <laughs> so that's the challenge. If we were here again, I would ask, what does what? disengages students in an online class and what might engage our audience in the online class. Again, I love learning together and actually I'm going to talk about how we can continue to do that even online. So back in 2016, I had two immediate ideas and this came from hanging out with journalists back years ago. <laughs> Number one, get outside. You don't need fancy cameras and lighting kits and tripods and all that sort of thing. I'll show you some examples here in just a couple of minutes. You can film a great video lecture simply by using your laptop. I'm in my home office, library, laptop sitting on a ladder so that I can stand up uh, to deliver this. Um, yes, I'm violating the cardinal rule of not being outside, uh, but it's been raining and, and I wanted to get this done quickly. Uh, second thing, whatever you do, if able, stand up. Now, if you've got bad knees uh, or you use a wheelchair, it's no problem. The whole idea, or the main thing that I want to emphasize here is energy and enthusiasm. That's what comes across. And so you need to, to ramp that up before you start your lecture if you're uh, going to record. So let's talk about that. Here are my top 10 ways to keep your students awake and enhance learning, particularly with online. It works both, but online is more important. Number 11, what? Yeah, there's a lot more than 10. Go synchronous. So we have Zoom, we have GoToMeeting, WebEx, all of these offer live synchronous meeting platforms. Uh, you need to learn some of the easy meeting management tricks. Get a, a monitor or a 
if you can, who can watch the chat, and who can um, manipulate the, the uh, breakout rooms and things like that. Learn how to mute everyone if you've got a large uh, section lecture. And then later you can allow those microphones to turn on to have, uh, to have discussion and things like that. Number 10, and also the most important, give a dang. <laughs> Invest some time. Developing a PowerPoint, posting readings online, takes some time. But filming that PowerPoint, taking the extra step, adding real examples from the real world takes more time. I'm going to show some real examples of that here in just a few minutes as well. Invest time in your audience. With the distance, it's more critical. And don't forget the energy. You've got to bring that, particularly asynchronously. Number nine, if you can work it into your lecture, mention beer. Why not? Uh, actually, okay, backstory quickly. This is the Fifth Street Brew Pub in Dayton. Uh, I worked with them for a couple of years facilitating uh, some strategy and, and planning. They were one of only two cooperatively owned breweries in the U.S. back in 2014. They had complex leadership structures. Employee management, profit strategies were slightly different or a different target, I guess. Uh, board oversight, decision making. This was uh, from a lecture of, of, uh, from a management class and it got the students' attention. It probably also made them where I wonder where I hang out on the weekends. But <laughs> Okay, number eight, vary your teaching location. So in this one, uh, dysfunctions of a team. So this is a teamwork lecture. So I literally just drove my car over to the Ohio State. And the place is iconic. It's the horseshoe. Everybody knows it. I parked my car and literally sat my computer on the back ledge of like the little uh, wing, you know, from my hatchback and started filming. There were people driving by thinking, who's this crazy professor? Um, but, you know, that's me, so I didn't really worry too much about it. Uh, so vary your teaching locations. Vary your outfits. So here I'm back at the stadium. This was a, a lecture that I did on coaching and mentoring for the uh, OSU Leadership Center. And here I put on the jersey, the hat. I had to talk my way into the stadium because it's, uh, it's uh, um, secured. But the, the, the guy at the, the gate said, well, I guess you're a faculty member. Just don't touch anything while you're in there. <laughs> so I went in. There were, there were people in the background having a stadium tour while I was filming, which was cool. I actually took my uh, class last semester on a stadium tour, and, and they really liked it. But that gives you some visual interest, and it mixes it up. Again, it's real life. It's online. Or even though it's online, you can just add some visual interest. Very important. Uh, but please... Please, no green screens, unless you acknowledge it. Or maybe if you're doing B-roll, maybe you're teaching a hydroponics class or something, or you have some field research or studies, and so you've got that rolling in the background, that's okay. But you don't want to have that fake green screen as if you're standing in front of Ohio Stadium, because it's just not real. And you miss all the fun things of people walking by in the background. So students know it, they see it. Number six, go out on a limb or in a cemetery or the Arctic cold. So my, my uh, right hand photo there, I've got on a big heavy winter jacket, another 15 minutes and, and the ground was covered. My, my laptop was getting wet. Um, I don't remember the lecture at that day, but it was certainly visually interesting um, and something just to mix it up. <clears throat> uh, in the cemetery, I think I was talking about, um, oh, do you have a bucket list? So, and of, and of course it follows, well, if you have a bucket list, you're thinking about dying, but that's a good thing because the Dalai Lama and, and Desmond Tutu in their book say that uh, when we do that, <clears throat> we're prioritizing what matters in life and we're doing those important things instead of wasting time. And so pretty powerful stuff. I stole a lot of that also from Andy Stanley. I gave him credit, but anyway. Uh, so if you don't go out on a limb, go up on a roof. Here I am at the uh, South by the uh, Ohio Union. This is the South Oval. And I think this was the last lecture on a, on a manage, or a leadership class. And I was given that 10,000 foot, that was the idea and the analogy there, uh, to give the 10,000 foot overview of the semester and encouraging my students to think about perspective. And so you remember Robin Williams and Dead Poets Society, stand up on your desktops, you know, change your perspective and, and how you are looking at things. It can be a powerful thing. If I'm teaching in person, I'll use that kinesthetic learning. I'll, I'll have them do something uh, to engage not just their, their brains, engage their hands to engage their brains and help gain some perspective, particularly if we're trying to think outside the box 
or, uh, or co-learn something together or facilitate a uh, strategic planning initiative or something like that. Powerful stuff. Number four, use real photos from your conferences and tours. We go on these all the time. We take pictures, but do we, do we download them and put them in our class slides? It can be really powerful. This is, uh, I think, from Michigan State. I was on a local food tour or some symposium, food insecurity uh, conference. And uh, I'm sure I use that <clears throat> in a lecture at some point. Number three, provide a roadmap to help your students see where you're going. Now, not one from Wales. Uh, I didn't have any idea what that sign meant uh, when I took the picture, but I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, online in, in particular, your students need to know where you're going because you're not seeing them, you're not having even those quick conversations in class or when you're meeting in person. So that's important that you give them that roadmap so they understand. Number two, think about using TED Talks and YouTube videos. To paraphrase Simon Sinek there, I, I would say students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And he says, you know, people don't buy what you do, they buy what you do it. Uh, you can, uh, adding in the videos and the TED Talks and even clips from, uh, from funny TV shows, um, I'll do that pretty frequently and, and it just breaks it up, but it also lets you make points and it can be really powerful. The number one way to improve your lectures, you know it. Mention beer. <laughs> okay, no, that's not really the number one way. Although, interestingly, so I did a TED Talk a few years ago, and, and it was, I was right before lunch, literally the last speaker before lunch. I was talking about local food, so everybody's hungry. Uh, there were 1,100 people in the room, and I was doing some, some math about if each of us spent $100, we could add $100,000 to the economy. And, uh, and that's just with food. And then I said, but what about local beer? And I put this slide up and the whole room just erupted in laughter and uh, it kind of scared me a little bit. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but it got their attention. So anyway, it's not the number one uh, thing to do. The number one real way to improve your lectures is to find teaching intersections. Look for where theory meets practice. <clears throat> that's the absolute magic Point. You guys know this. I'm talking to experienced educators, instructors, professors. Um, where theory meets practice, you can share your experiences and the real life stories that add so much value to the instruction. Students tell me this all the time, that that is the most interesting um, part of a lecture or of a semester. Um, guest speakers, when you bring them in, or including the TED Talks and things, you're getting that real life example into the theory, bringing it to life. Powerful stuff. Okay, if this were an online lecture, I would say in the video and assign some quick feedback via your course management system. And a couple of example questions here. Since this is a, uh, a teaching class, I would say jot down one or two, two or three key points that resonated and then describe how you might use or implement one of these in the context of your work. So again, that reflection, we know that reflection helps to cement uh, learning. Think about Bloom's taxonomy. We're trying to push our students and move them from just knowledge or understanding up through analysis and synthesis creatively then using what we're teaching them. This is a way to do that, engaging online. So I'm going to keep going now. Uh, obviously just making two videos if you're doing this. So that was my top 10 list from a few years ago. Let's add a few things just in uh, that I've learned in conversation with students and, and other uh, uh, instructors and faculty uh, over the last few years. Number one, capture attention. My opening slide, aside from the title and opening line, what was my opening line? Online teaching does not equal online learning. So aside from that, I jumped right in with two questions. I used the word imagine or think about or remember when. Those words engage your brain and they get you thinking and they're powerful. So when you do that, before I introduce myself or anything else, uh, I, I hopefully got you thinking and captured your attention. And then I ask you the big punch question, is that you? <laughs> um, lost in translation, don't get lost in translation. Jokes, uh, uh, shoot, what's the word? Uh, not cynicism, um, anyway. <laughs> Things don't come over in text. Uh, so here was a, an example that I just sent, unfortunately, last week to my wife and daughters. I stopped at lunch uh, at the bank, 
two men were wearing surgical masks. We were all worried they had the coronavirus. But then they pulled out guns and said it was surgical robbery, and we all felt much better. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Until I got a text back saying, Dad, are you okay? Oh, man. So I'm going to, like, literally go buy my daughter some Beatles albums to make up for that. I feel really bad. Um, they collect vinyl. How cool is that? Anyway, um, don't get lost in translation. Don't get lost in correction. Don't be cruel. Even small comments can be taken wrong. You've got to be careful of this. A couple of years ago, I had a, uh, we get SEI student evaluation instruction, and one of the qualitative comments said, uh, Dr. Raisin was cruel in his comments, uh, redlining my paper or something like that. And, and that really hit me. And it, it gave me pause, and I thought back, you know, are my, all those red lines cruel? And, uh, and, I, and then it, I remembered my very first lecture, and I hope this student missed it, otherwise he or she may not have written that comment. The very first lecture, whether I'm in person or online, I'll ask the students, why are you taking this class? Haven't you heard that I'm tyrannical and I'm awful and I redline everything and I scream proofread? <laughs> and uh, in fact, let me tell you some of my feedback. And I'll put a, a slide up with quotes. This paper needs help from someone who knows how to write. <laughs> and then I'll ask the students online again or in class, what do you think about that? Is that a bit harsh? Well, hold on. Before we go too far, that's my feedback. But that's not feedback I've given students. That's feedback that I have received from a journal editor based on a manuscript that I didn't put enough time into. And I don't want you all to ever experience that. So I'm gonna be tough on you. I'm not gonna be cruel, I'm gonna to be tough on you. But I want you to know that I'm doing it so that you'll learn and grow and you won't have that happen to you in the real world. It's not any fun. Lost in correction, uh, being careful. Check your bias. Yes, online, implicit bias. Uh, I took this from another lecture that I'd given Thoughts unspoken, we, we have this, we have to be careful even online as we, um, as we do our, our lectures and as we choose slides, etc. cetera. Uh, offer coaching, I, I love Linkage's definition here. The coaching, guiding good people to make the most of their capabilities, position them to work more effectively. But look at the picture, who's coaching who? Consider co-learning with your students, essentially it's a, question of epistemology. I mean, how do we create knowledge? Do we co-learn? Can we? Certainly, if you're teaching an, an undergrad physics class and it's a lecture, then, then maybe there's a one-way dissemination of information where you're just letting them know and, and hopefully giving examples to make it real. Uh, but in, in graduate education especially, there's a lot more opportunity. I always learn from my classes, undergrad and grad, and that excites me, and I let my students know that. I share them, share that with them. Add color, add diversity. I'm not talking about t-shirt color, of course. Uh, this is from a hops workshop down there, South Centers in Piketon. But what people see, that diversity, oh yeah, roll your eyes, the collective iceberg. <laughs> We've all seen this. But when was the last time we really stopped and thought about it? Particularly if we're doing distance. So in person, we see a small amount of a person. There's all the rest of the things that make them up that we don't see. Online, there's another step removed. So we really need to be super conscious of this. A couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago, I was teaching a uh, three-hour workshop for the um, OSU Leadership Center. So I had faculty and staff from across the university there. And, and when it was over, it was on coaching and mentoring. Uh, a woman came up and said, Brian, I just want to thank you for your slides and your words. And I said, well, you're, you're welcome. She said, she said, you, I could tell by the pictures you used and the words that you used, you had very inclusive language and you value diversity. And I want to thank you for that. And I looked at her and I thought, I, I, one, I'm so thankful that you said that. I, am, I appreciate that. I, I try. And she looked, I would say, pretty white. And she said, let me explain. I'm Latina. And it mattered a lot. <sighs> And so I was just, I was touched, we hugged, you know. <laughs> anyway, please be attentive. We forget this, and, and we need to not forget that. All right, um, consider your leadership. What? I'm talking about teaching, I'm talking about pedagogy, andragogy. 
leadership? Yes, you're leading the class and you have to be responsible for figuring out what motivates those you are leading. How can you create that environment where folks are encouraged to flourish? It's powerful. So leadership, North House, of course, in the individual influencing the group to achieve that common goal, getting through the class, <laughs> learning, moving up Bloom's taxonomy, whatever it may be. Uh, some things, and you, you know these obviously still about charismatic leadership. How can you be more charismatic in your online teaching? Again, energizing, bringing that to the lecture, particularly if it's asynchronous. Servant leadership, how can you more better serve your students? Here with the online, it's even more important because they're, again, one step removed and they may not see that roadmap of where this class is going and your syllabus needs to become longer and more explicit so they'll understand exactly what you're requiring of them through this course. How can you be more, more authentic? And, uh, and I would add transparency, uh, transparent leadership in here so that we're really connecting with our students and, and trying and they see that as we kind of learn how to do this better. Two tickets. Key takeaways to, to reflect, get outside, and if you're able, stand up or get that energy, your voice, your tone, your inflection. Okay, if this were an online lecture again, I would say stop. Engage your students in your course management with some feedback. Post on the discussion board, for example, a brief example of where you've seen poor online instruction. So that's germane, of course, to this lecture. So that would be an actual question that I would ask. And then comment by suggesting a fix applying theory or principles from the lecture or from your readings to one of your classmates' posts. Again, we're cementing the learning, the reflection, etc. Powerful stuff, and it gets that involvement and moves people into the lecture. I started to say we're finished, but I forgot. Homework. I have to assign homework. It's what I do. Watch some online instruction videos. Watch stand-up comedy or storytelling. Um, stories from the stage, PBS. Powerful stuff. Don't well watch it for the for the laughter. We all need that. Um, but la watch it for the delivery and the timing and the inflection and the approach and the setup. That can be powerful, and it can really help you improve. Uh, also, take the Harvard implicit bias test. Bias test. You, a lot of you have probably done that. Um, just again, keeping that awareness of our students and engaging them, particularly with this distance now that we're, some of us, a lot of us are experiencing. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. I hope this has been helpful. Um, I'm going to work on a couple of more ideas. Glad to engage and, uh, and talk with you further. If you have questions, just get a hold of me. Thanks so much.